Hi everyone! So these pre-recorded Wednesday classes sometimes will be a little heavy on PowerPoints and content, and sometimes there'll be an encouragement and an invitation to do some discussion, which Karina will help facilitate, and I'll send some questions ahead of time. But it's really a time to get very clear on the content itself so that when we meet again on Mondays, we can kind of flesh out how it's landing. Um, I think you remember sometimes it's a lot more enriching to have a discussion when we've all understood the concept. Then we can decide whether we agree or disagree with the concept and we can kind of go from there a little bit more easily. Now, of course, if bits of the content itself is unclear, that's going to be really understandable in a topic like this. Um, tenants is very nuanced. Um, why do we talk about tenants? We talk about tenants because it's really a discussion of identity and all of the different ways that holding identity too tightly can create barriers and divisiveness and increase the feelings of isolation and separation that we have. And I think a lot of the work that you do personally as psychoanalysts is trying to understand what people's identity is in relation to others and to help kind of dissolve a lot of the barriers that make people feel so alienated and different from one another. So think of the study of tenants really as a discussion of identity and we know that if you don't know who you are that can be a problem but if you think you are who you are in a finite permanent unchanging way that's a problem as well. So I'm hoping as we talk about tenants, we'll really be able to go deeply into how is the relationship between identification and conflict, both inner and outer. So here we go with the PowerPoint. So we're in year three, semester B, Understanding Reality Part Two. Understanding Reality Part 1 you did with Venerable Amy Miller and we discussed a lot about the two truths and looked in depth into a lot of the areas of that subject. So hopefully you have a good understanding of relative truth and ultimate truth. If you don't, make sure you go back through your notes and become really clear on those terms. So the presentations for this semester are going to be from Virtue and Reality and How Things Exist by Lama Zopa Rinpoche. A Commentary on a Praise of Dependent Arising by Geshe Nawan Senten, Relative Truth and Ultimate Truth as well as Emptiness by Geshe Teshisari, Appearance and Reality by Guy Newland, Meditation on Emptiness and Emptiness Yoga by Jeffrey Hopkins, and then the Oral Teachings of My Root Guru, Yurme Kensa Rinpoche Geshe Teshisari, from when he taught tenants in 2002 and 2006 while I was at Chen Rezig Institute. So any errors are due to me, and I apologize in advance. This is a very nuanced and difficult subject, and people spend years and years and years trying to get clear on it. I'm looking forward to teaching it with you guys. I think it's going to be really interesting and intriguing, but it's possible that I'll make some mistakes along the way because it is a very complicated subject. The two truths are, once again, Ultimate Truths, also called Absolute Truths, and Conventional Truths, also called Relative Truths. Explanations of the distinction between the two truths find a place in the assertions of each of the four tenet systems that are recognized by the Geluk order of Tibetan Buddhism as authentic formulations of Buddha's teachings. Just as the seal of a notary marks a document as authentic, these four systems each have four seals, or views, that mark them as authentic Buddhist doctrine. They are 1. All products are impermanent. 2. All contaminated things are miserable. 3. All phenomena are selfless. 4. Nirvana is peace. So we've talked about these before in the past, but probably quite briefly that all products are impermanent basically means that anything that is produced is subject to momentary disintegration moment by moment by moment. That anything that is produced is going to change. 
The second point is that all contaminated things are miserable, meaning anything contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions is in the nature of suffering. All phenomena, both permanent and impermanent phenomena, both uncontaminated and contaminated phenomena, all phenomena are selfless, meaning empty, and from our perspective in the Gaelic tradition, in the Madhyamaka Prasangika view, all phenomena are empty of inherent existence. And then nirvana is peace, meaning nirvana is a state beyond suffering. So all four Buddhist tenet systems agree on this, but how they present it and what they mean by the terminology is definitely going to vary. But if we can just kind of get very clear that all four Buddhist tenet schools adhere to these four seals. This is what stamps them as an authentic Buddhist tenet system. So if they don't agree on these four in some form, then they're not a Buddhist tenet system, they're a tenet system of some other philosophy. So the four Buddhist tenet systems are the Great Exposition, the Sutra, the Mind Only, and the Middle Way. And the Middle Way is further divided into two, the Autonomous and the Consequentialists. Now the Consequentialist view is the view that you're used to hearing about. This is the view that we usually speak from. When we did Lorig, Awarenesses and Knowers with Venerable Children, that presentation is also coming a bit from the Sutra school because their presentation of mind is very, very clear. But generally speaking, you're used to the subtlest view, the middle way consequence view. Now we're gonna go back to the beginning, starting with the Great Exposition School and try and understand how is their view of self, this coarser view of self, rational from their perspective, and even kind of operating from that perspective might be useful for us, even though we know we're going towards the middle way consequence school view eventually. So Gelukpas, that's us, as opposed to Kagyu, Nyingma, Sakya, the other forms of Tibetan Buddhism, as well as Rime. Gelukpas traditionally claim that all who hold Buddhist tenets can be included within one of these four schools. This does not comprise all Buddhists, because there are many persons who have taken refuge in the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, from the depths of their hearts, and thus are Buddhists, but who do not propound Buddhist tenets. It is also said that to qualify as a proponent of a particular system, it is necessary actually to realize the selflessness taught by that system. Thus, for example, one does not become a proponent of the tenets of the Middle Way School until one first realizes emptiness, as it is explained in the Middle Way School. The word translated as tenant means an established conclusion, and thus a proponent of tenets is not a person who is merely sympathetic with a certain position, it is a person who knows it to be correct and intends not to give it up. However, what one system regards as a profound and definitive knowledge may be superficial or even wrong from the viewpoint of a higher system. The primary metaphor behind the Gelug study of tenets is not the timeline of Western scholarship, but a ladder on which the rungs are tenant systems. Each higher rung provides a better view than the one below it. But only when one reaches the highest rung, the middle way consequence school, does one see how things really exist. So these are the three texts that you all actually have in your possession physically, as well as having the PDFs. And week by week, I'll be telling you which pages to look at in order to better understand the content of that week. So first of all, you're going to be looking at Virtue and Reality, pages 80 to 83. This was also read out loud to you in the introduction video that I sent a few days ago. Also, a commentary on a praise of dependent arising. I want you to look at the commentary of verse 10, and that's pages 54 to 58 in the hard copy, 
or pages 30 to 32 in the PDF. So this is a really important um, little section to get your head around. Also in your readings for this week and next week is Intro to Lower Tenant Schools, and um, that was sent to you, but if you can't find it in your email, the link is below. So just some excerpts from your readings. Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, in Virtue and Reality, Buddha taught varying levels of philosophy to guide sentient beings' minds gradually up to the level where they could realize the prasangika view of emptiness. One could start with the grossest explanations of emptiness taught by the lower schools and gradually progress up to the most subtle, the prasangika. That's how the four schools came into being. The lower schools were steps to the higher ones, leading ultimately to the prasangika, so even though the views of these various schools seem to contradict each other, actually they're a method for gradually developing, through study and meditation, the prasangika view. These are four schools of Buddhist philosophy. Vaibhashika, Great Exposition, Sautrantika, the Sutra, Chittamatra, the Mind Only, and Madhyamika, the Middle Way. The fourth of these is the Middle Way School and is divided into two, Svatantrika, the Autonomist, and Prasangika, or Prasangika, the Consequentialists. So from your readings from A Praise to Dependent Arising, Lama Tsongkhapa's root verse says, How could your system be understood? by those who perceive the way of interdependent arising contrarily or as non-existent. And Geshe-la explains, The Buddha said that a thing being a dependent arising proves its lack of inherent existence. But there are lower Buddhist schools, the realists, who believe the exact opposite, that because things are dependent arisings, they are inherently existent. These lower Buddhist tenant holders are thus referred to as those who perceive the way of interdependent arising contrarily. Those who perceive interdependent arising as non-existent refers to non-Buddhists who say dependent arising does not exist at all, holding that phenomena do not have the nature of dependent arising. So these realists refers to the Great Exposition and the Sutra School. Geshe-la's commentary continues. Lama Tsongkhapa questions how both the lower school Buddhist tenet holders, who believe the exact opposite, that dependent arising means things inherently exist, and the non-Buddhists, who do not believe in dependent arising at all, could understand the Buddhist system. The understanding of dependent arising is the indispensable method for realizing emptiness. And without realizing emptiness, there is no method to remove all the delusions from their root and achieve the final goal. Let us understand why these lower Buddhist schools believe that dependent arising means that things inherently exist. So we just pause the PowerPoint for a minute and reflect on this idea of interdependence or dependent arising as the proof for emptiness. And this is the middle way consequence view that we're used to hearing. All things are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. This is called the king of reasons. So we need to kind of sit with why is it that some schools of thought believe that there is a self that does not dependently arise. So of course a non-Buddhist school example would be like a Hindu school that might believe in Atman. And we also will see this maybe in pop psychology, this idea of like finding an authentic self, like there's a core at the center of you that gathers experiences to it or discards habits from it but there's still like a central thing that is totally the same moment to moment. 
And even though as Buddhists we don't agree with that, you can really see why they think that. If you think about who was I when I was five years old, if you think about yourself at five, it sort of feels like you are the same person thinking the same thoughts that just evolved and got more sophisticated. But then if you saw a five-year-old, you'd think, oh, right, that's a child. That's a tiny child. Of course the thoughts I had at that age are different than the thoughts I have now. Significantly different. I'm a totally different person than my child self. And of course there was a continuity. One moment led to another. One training led to another. One experience led to another. That's all true. But it doesn't mean that there was some sort of hardcore, I don't know, soul, for lack of a better word. And of course, you know, you can say that the primary mental consciousness is akin to the soul, the way other religions describe it. But when people talk about a soul, they do seem to have this connotation around it as some sort of self that has always been there. And of course, we're going to wind up negating that. But it's important to sit with and yet I still do feel that way. It does feel like there is a self like that. This is just who I am. This is just how I operate. There are key personality traits that have been the same the whole time. And to sit with the feeling of that before jumping to, of course, none of that is inherently existent and none of that is permanent. And what's more, identifying with it creates opportunities to feel other than whatever you identify as. We want to just kind of push pause and feel that the non-Buddhist systems and the lower tenant systems do make sense experientially, even if logically they're not as sound. So we'll move on into kind of the context of how all these tenant schools came about more specifically. And so now we'll look at the evolution of Buddhist thought from Relative Truth, Ultimate Truth, by Geshe Tashi Saring, from the Foundation of Buddhist Thought Series, Volume 2. If you were to ask me, as a Tibetan monk from the monastic system, what the final view of Buddhist thought is, I would say that it is the Prasangika Madhyamaka view, that all things and events are free of any intrinsic reality. That does not mean, however, that we should only study the Prasangika Madhyamaka system. A clear understanding of the evolution of the philosophical systems allows us to see and appreciate the ever-growing subtlety of the view. In actuality, it is very difficult to jump to the final view without a grounding in the lower or less subtle systems, in the same way as it would be foolhardy to attempt a PhD before completing one's bachelor or master's degrees. Historically and logically, it appears that one school grew from another and that different views emerged gradually and were created by different scholars. But we need to be very clear that there is nothing here that the Buddha did not teach. All the shades of philosophy studied in the Tibetan monasteries come from the Buddha. He taught not only the Pali Sutras that are studied in the Theravadan schools, but also the perfection of wisdom, Prajnaparamita Sutras, from the so-called second turning of the Dharma wheel, and the Buddha Nature Sutra, Tathagatagarbha Sutra, from the third turning. So this is really important that we realize that despite the fact that the tenant schools were popularized by various scholars or um, spread by various traditions, that they actually did all originate from the Buddha. The Buddha taught various degrees of subtlety on purpose. The Buddha's teachings are usually divided into three baskets or pitakas. The Vinaya Pitaka, the Abhidharma Pitaka, and the Sutra Pitaka. The Vinaya basket discourses are mainly concerned with the rules and regulations of the monastic community, whereas the Sutra basket comprises the bulk of the teachings of the Buddha, 
those on developing compassion, concentration, and so on. There was never much debate about these two baskets, but the Abhidhamma teachings, which deal with philosophy, were debated extensively. It is often the case that once a philosophy becomes established, then there is time to reflect on the meaning of the teachings in all its detail. So it was with Buddhism. The debates really started once Buddhism became strong and established in India. This, in turn, led to sectarian development, with some practitioners leaning toward one developing system of ideas and other practitioners toward another. These rigorous debates took place in many universities, the greatest of which was Nalanda, located north of Bodhgaya in India. From 200 Common Era to 1200 Common Era, tens of thousands of scholars studied and debated with an incredible intensity and single-mindedness. So this image is of the 17 great Panditas in Nalanda, who we look to as our main sources of the Tibetan traditions of Buddhism. You'll see this image all over the place in Tibetan Buddhism, in a lot of monasteries, nunneries, dharma centers, and the reason is these are our main 17. And they existed in all different points during time throughout the history of Nalanda Monastery. And they really were most definitely Buddhas themselves, all 17 of them. If not Buddhas within their lifetime, then achieved Buddhahood in the Bardo or soon after in Pure Land. These are amazing scholars. And it's seen as very auspicious to connect with the lineage of the teaching that you're accessing at the beginning of the teaching. So our meditation today will include the prayer to the 17 great pandits of Galanda that His Holiness the Dalai Lama composed. So it's a way of becoming open to the lineage of blessings, to the oral tradition, and just kind of waking up our own wisdom as well. And then there's a little picture there of the Nalanda ruins present day. So you can visit Nalanda, um, but it's been mostly destroyed. Um, Nalanda has been re-established in Dharamsala and is the residence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So for a thousand years, Nalanda Monastery existed, and it pulled together all of the teachings of the Buddha, Vinaya, Sutra, Abhidharma, Tantra, everything was practiced there. It was this amazing place of scholarship. And so most of the teachings in Tibetan Buddhism come from the Nalanda tradition of India. And of course, Buddhism in India is not particularly prevalent anymore, except for the Tibetan refugees. Um, and so the Nalanda tradition as it was is held by the Tibetan tradition now. So that's important to know because most of the great texts that we rely on in Tibetan Buddhism come from Nalanda masters. Okay, so then continuing on how the tenant schools developed, we're going to look at a lot of these Nalanda masters. With the growing need to clarify concepts and to defend Buddhist ideas from the criticisms of non-Buddhist scholars, Buddhist practitioners worked hard at establishing exactly what Buddhism defined as truth which inevitably led to disagreements and differing opinions. In India, the Abhidharma texts were the main debating point because they explained the nature of reality of things and events. The Buddha's teachings clearly denied the existence of an ultimate creator, so using the doctrine of cause and effect, these early works sought to find logical explanations for how and why things come into existence. In ways that would seem very familiar to modern scientists, they relentlessly divided and subdivided the objects of the known world in an attempt to reach the basic building block of the universe. Belief in the reality of an atom-like building block is a hallmark of the Vaibhashika, or Great Exposition School. Then more radical views emerged, calling into question whether such a basic universal building block existed from its own side, a bit like the way quantum physicists radicalize the world of physics. This far from traditional interpretation of the Abhidharma texts started around the time of Nagarjuna and his student Aryadeva. It is generally agreed that Nagarjuna lived in the 2nd century Common Era, 
and was the founder of the Madhyamaka, or Middle Way School. So again, the Buddha did teach the Middle Way School, but he didn't like stamp it or give it a signpost and say, and now we are doing the Middle Way School. It was people like Nagarjuna who, through their own study and practice, came to this subtlest view and then returned to the Buddhist teachings and saw what he actually meant in a definitive way. So you see this picture of Nagarjuna always has snakes above him, as opposed to the picture of the Buddha with one big snake over him, sometimes depicted. This is Nagarjuna with many snakes. And you'll see below there's kind of a mermaid-like creature below him. And so Nagarjuna was said to have traveled to the land of the Nagas um, to get some of the teachings that had been lost by human beings since the Buddha's death but some uh, scholars existed in the Naga realms, and he was able to get teachings from them. So Nagas look like snakes, look like mermaids, or look like half-serpent, half-people, and they're loosely classed as hungry ghosts, but they sometimes have very sophisticated learning structures and sometimes don't suffer in such a coarse way as your traditional understanding of hungry ghosts. So it's an interesting kind of folklore, take it or leave it. Sometimes Nagas are described a bit like dragons. So anyway, you'll see these depictions in the iconography of Tibetan Buddhism, and it's just kind of a casual aside. But Nagarjuna certainly existed, and his student Arya Deva certainly existed, and they are the ones we really turn to to clarify the Middle Way view. So then we have Buddha Palita and his contemporary Bhava Viveka, from the 6th century, and both claim to be Madhyamaka and followers of Nagarjuna. But Baba Viveka strongly attacked Buddhapalita's commentary on Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise on the Middle Way, and defeated Buddhapalita's followers in debate. Later, Chandrakirti in the 7th century resuscitated Buddhapalita's views and attacked the position of Baba Viveka. Chandrakirti's works eventually became central to the Tibetan interpretation of Madhyamaka philosophy, especially within the Gelug school. And for this reason, Baba Viveka is often depicted in a negative light by Gelug commentators. The split between Baba Viveka's views and those of Chandrakirti form the basis for dividing Madhyamakas into Svatantraka, autonomy, and Prasangika, consequence. So we'll look at this distinction between the Svatantrika and the Prasangika later in the semester because they're both middle way. And Baba Viveka had a lot of really interesting points that he made, even though we eventually contradict those through Chandakirti's reasoning because his was superior. But uh, that's coming, but just kind of planting seeds, the division between the two Madhyamaka schools. Next, we find two brothers, Asanga and Vasubandhu. And you'll remember there was some references to them when we did our semester on Buddha nature. They had uh, visions from Maitreya and were able to bring the teachings of Maitreya about Buddha nature to human beings. You can see a tiny picture of Maitreya in the picture of Asanga. Also, Vasubandhu was said to have connection as well with holy beings. Anyway. The elder, Asanga, created a system of philosophy that became the Chittamatra, mind-only school, also called the Yogacarya school, which asserts that external objects have no reality separate from the consciousness that perceives them. So just sit with that highlighted portion for a minute. It seems like all of Buddhism is sort of saying this, that there are no external objects, that have a separate reality from the consciousness that perceives them. And it seems like that's the subtlest view, but actually there's a view more subtle than that, which does posit external forms, but in a very subtle way. And of course, very much related to consciousness. But the question is, where does matter come from? Where does form come from? What makes up the physical world? This is a really interesting examination, and I think there's a lot of parallels with quantum physicists and neuroscientists that can really help us explain 
the difference between this mind-only view and then subtlest view, the Madhyamaka. So kind of put a pin in that and really sit with where does form come from anyway and how do we interact with it? Why do we interact with it? Because we know that it's a lot more subtle than the way it appears. So this he, Asanga, claimed was the middle way between the realism of Vaibhashika and the nihilism of Madhyamaka. So Madhyamaka practitioners are not nihilists, but it seems as though we are. Madhyamaka scholars, not surprisingly, see themselves as holding the middle way, and Chittamatra concepts as idealism. So Asanga and Vasubandhu also wrote the Abhidharma texts that are most authoritative for Tibetan Buddhism. So here's some review, and please, 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 please learn these names. They are ordered from coarse to subtle, slash lowest to highest. These are the words to get stuck in your head so that you don't get lost as the next few weeks progress. So, Vaibhashika is the Great Exposition School. Sautrantika is the Sutra School. Chittamatra, the Mind Only School. Madhyamaka, the Middle Way School, which is further subdivided into autonomous and consequentialists. So I know I've already said this before, but please try and get these words in your head. I'll try to remember to use both um, the English and the non-English terms, but sometimes I might use one or the other, just, you know, if I'm speaking off the top of my head about something, so I don't want you to get lost. So if you can get these four into your head, um, then it'll also be easier to understand what each one is making in terms of their point. Okay, so the first two schools, which are the lower schools, the coarser, grosser schools, the first two schools, the Vaibhashika, Great Exposition, and the Sautrantika, Sutra School, searched for the basic building block of the universe, and because these basic particles were seen as truly existent, these two schools are known as realist schools. These two schools assert only the selflessness of persons, not the selflessness of phenomena. So they're saying that people are selfless, but things, objects, matter, etc. aren't. So there's an interesting kind of contradiction there, and yet we kind of get what they mean, right? We kind of understand that it seems like, sure, people are growing and changing and evolving and are the result of many causes and conditions, parts and context, mind imputation. Sure, yep, I can see that with people. But objects just are what they are. So you can kind of see where they're coming from. The third school, the Chittamatra, mind-only school, the intrinsic reality of external objects is questioned. It is argued that whereas the mind is real, the objects perceived by the mind cannot have independent existence because of that very reliance on the mind to ascertain them. So the mind-only school goes totally the other direction and is saying there isn't anything external at all. So not just not inherently external, but not external at all. Everything is mind. So then finally, there is the Madhyamaka Middle Way School, the fourth, and some I can, tradition considers highest or most subtle school. The Madhyamaka view is the Middle Way because its position lies between what it sees as the eternalism of the first two schools that sees objects as existing from their own side, and the nihilism of the Chittamatra school that asserts that things and events have no reality at all. The four schools are divided into the non-Mahayana schools of Vaibhashika and Satrantika, and the Mahayana schools of Chittamatra and Madhyamaka. So this is an important distinction to understand as well. Those first two schools are non-Mahayana. The third and fourth are Mahayana. So then we look at these lower tenant schools first, and there's some shared ideas that the Vaibhashika, 
great exposition school and the Sautrantika, the Sutra school, agree on? Of the four main Buddhist tenet schools, the Vibhashika and Sautrantika schools are both considered Nathnalhiyana and so-called realist schools, in that they, generally speaking, assert that there is an external reality with a findable, fundamental, heartless particle, which is the basis for all form of matter, as well as partless moments of consciousness. Their conclusion is that objects do in fact exist inherently, intrinsically. They both agree that the self, however, is selfless in the sense of lacking self-sufficiency and substantiality. So, when we look at this concept of a partless particle, that there would be the smallest possible unit of form, and that's the building block that everything else is built on top of, we refute that, saying there's a lot of reasons why we don't think that's true. But even if you got to the very smallest of all things, even if there were such a thing, it would still have a right side and a left side and a top and a bottom, and it would exist in contrast to other particles around it. So it can't inherently exist because it depends on directions, context, other particles, etc., etc. So then the Vibhashika school, the Great Exposition school, the two truths, according to the Vibhashika school, are types of objects of knowledge, but are not subjective consciousnesses that observe or know those objects. So object of knowledge, that which is suitable, is an object of awareness. Object, that which is known by awareness. That's what we normally look to as our definition they're looking at things a little bit different. So built into this categorization is an understanding that there is a deep relationship between objects of knowledge and the consciousness apprehending them, that there is a difference in the way an object exists when it is analyzed by a consciousness and found to function and when it isn't. So as defined in Vasubandhu's Treasury of Knowledge, which the Vaivashikas use, if the awareness of something does not operate after that thing is destroyed or mentally separated into other things, then that thing exists conventionally, like a pot or water. Others exist ultimately. So the definition of a relative conventional truth for them is a phenomena which is such that if it were physically destroyed or mentally separated into parts, the consciousness apprehending it would be cancelled. Vibashikas believe that partless particles and the aggregates exist ultimately, but the person themselves does not exist ultimately. In holding that premise, they perhaps have a more comfortable certainties in their lives, thinking that there is some fundamental core or place to land at the end of an examination of interdependency. So this is just something interesting to examine, that they can cope with the idea that a person doesn't exist inherently, that a person does not exist ultimately, that maybe it is merely labeled on the collection of parts, but the collection of parts do exist ultimately. So the aggregates, remember, being form, the body, feeling, discrimination or recognition, compositional factors, and consciousness. And normally we say those five aggregates are the basis of imputation of the self. They're saying that in a way the aggregates are the core things and then you put self on top of them. So it can sound similar, but when we say the self is merely labeled on the collection of aggregates, each of the aggregates is also merely labeled, merely labeled, merely labeled. So it's not like you get to like a final aggregate or a primary aggregate. Everything is dependent. So the Sautrantika, the Sutra school, they're known for its clear presentation of the mind and for what distinguishes valid from invalid consciousnesses in the presentation of the seven types of awareness. 
So even though they're a lower school, they spend a lot of time describing consciousness and how consciousness operates. And so we usually use the Sutra School presentation of low rig or awarenesses and knowers, just because it's a really excellent presentation. Even though their tenant schools about relative and ultimate truth are not exactly what we agree on, their presentation of the mind is excellent, so we use it. So in Dharmakirti's commentary on valid cognition, he explains, Existent phenomena is that which is apprehended by valid cognition. This explanation is key in trying to understand how the mind is mistaken and what it appears to under the influence of self-grasping ignorance. That said, they do not think that everything is mind. They believe in external things that exist independent from mind and act as a condition for consciousness to arise. For the Sautrantika school, ultimate truths are able to perform a function and conventional truths are not. It is an ultimate truth if it is phenomena that exists from its own side without being imputed by conceptual consciousness. And so then we compare those two lower schools, and I understand you might not totally have your head around the position of these first two schools. Just kind of let the words wash over you and, you know, settle and digest at whatever speed feels comfortable. We'll come back to it, but uh, we'll just kind of compare the two and see if that helps clarify. The Vaiveshika school has a few uncommon positions. One is that they believe that the seven treatises of the Abhidharma, that their main text is based on, were taught by the Buddha directly. This view is not held by the Sautrantika school, who hold that those Abhidharma treatises were commentaries written by subsequent Indian masters. The key difference between the Vaibhashika and Sautrantika schools is that only the Vaibhashika school does not assert non-affirming negations in any context. For them, even space and selflessnesses are affirming negations. So they imply something. This idea seems to indicate that they hold to the idea that there is some aspect of all phenomena out there that is finable, definable, and has an objective type of existence in and of itself, while somehow also not being permanent, unitary, or independent. So you can find a bit more on that from Alexander Burzen's graded study of the two truths in the Indian ten systems um, on his Study Buddhism website. So what vocabulary would you like clarified? And you can, you know, scroll back through the PowerPoint, which you have as a PDF. But what vocabulary, you know, words that just you don't know how they're used, um, maybe selflessness, maybe you understand those or maybe not, but just kind of give me a little list of the vocabulary that you want to make sure gets clarified. And then what concepts are already intriguing and or confusing. So if you want to just kind of highlight for yourself some sections of the text which made you go, oh, that's so cool, tell me more, or I have no idea what that means, can we go back to that? Please take a minute and discuss amongst yourselves and maybe write down in one list, maybe Karina or one of you can compile it and send it to me before March 7th. And then we can talk about it on Monday. So I really... Um, appreciate a little bit of feedback to know if I'm losing you or if you're all up to speed and you're ready to move on to the next section. Um, let me know either way. We don't have to be fast. We can go at a really normal speed or a comfortable speed for everyone. Just uh, let me know where you're at. Okay, so I hope some of that was interesting and intriguing for you guys. And uh, now Karina will lead Shantideva's dedication prayer in Hebrew and then uh, we'll do meditation. <laughs> 